Howdy everyone. Welcome to This Old Vegan. My name is Merlene Vassell and in this video it's story time. I'm going to read you a selection from my novel, The Vampire and the Vegan, Book One, Food. I walked into Christopher's Seafood Restaurant and before the maitre d' could seat me, I had already spotted my next meal. Tall, handsome, and well-dressed, he appeared to be in his 30s. His skin was a rich caramel color, and his shoulder-length dreadlocks were each exactly the same thickness and length. His short goatee was also painstakingly groomed. I smiled as the word dapper came to mind. Most women would have probably focused on the muscularity of his arms and chest, clearly visible through his lavender silk shirt, or his firm, round buttocks for that matter. But what allured me was his choice of entree, lobster. I watched intently as he carefully selected his prey from the large fish tank that had been situated just inside the entrance to the restaurant. This was an obvious attempt to entice those with a taste for freshly killed sea animals. He pointed out the largest lobster and watched lustfully as the chef's assistant removed the tired and bewildered animal from the cloudy gray water. His claws had been restrained with two thick rubber bands, but this was unnecessary. There was no way for him to escape, nowhere for him to go, and he was too confused and exhausted to fight any longer. In a few minutes, he would experience the searing pain of being boiled alive. The dapper man returned to his table and his date, an attractive young woman of no consequence. I knew that he would be leaving with me. I waited patiently to be seated. My hunger peaked now that dinner was so imminent. Good evening, the young woman serving as maitre d' finally greeted me. How many in your party? Just one. Would you like a table by the window? No, a seat at the end of the bar. As I followed her the short distance, I felt a deep emptiness in my gut. My body was aching for nourishment and the sensation was almost unbearable. It was as if my insides were caving in and I was even getting a little lightheaded. Yet my visible demeanor never changed. No one who looked at me could see even a hint of the intense hunger that I was experiencing. Gracefully, I seated myself on the bar stool, crossing my legs to reveal their sensuous contours accented by black silk stockings and stiletto heels. The hem of my dress rode up to mid-thigh. From the vantage point of the bar, I was able to see and be seen by my prey. I wouldn't have much longer to wait Despite his banter with his date, it was clear that my target had noticed me and he was unable to stop glancing in my direction. He was momentarily distracted as the waiter brought the dead crustacean to his table, along with a shrimp entree for the young woman. Once the food arrived, the couple's conversation ceased. I watched as the man used a nutcracker to break the animal's claw and a fork to pull out the soft tissue within. He dipped the flesh into a small bowl of melted butter, put it into his mouth, and slowly chewed, savoring the flavor in a manner that was almost erotic. I caught his eye and deliberately held his gaze for a moment too long. Then I bent over to brush an imaginary speck from the top of my shoe. This offered him a glimpse of cleavage peeking out over the plunging neckline of the lipstick red dress that I had chosen for tonight's hunt. He smiled at me. I stared into his eyes and enthralled him. He was now doomed, like a hungry fish drawn to a fisherman's bait, unaware that within the tasty morsel lies a jagged hook about to tear into his flesh. The one seeking a meal would become a meal himself. I could hardly wait. I continued to watch my prey enjoy his meal for a while longer. It would be his last, and I wanted him to finish it. But he was a slow eater, and I could see that his date was trying to make conversation. I was starving. Good evening, the bartender interrupted my thoughts 
and I turned my head to look at him. He was young and appeared to be of Italian or Middle Eastern descent. He had straight jet black hair and olive skin and was clad in the typical bartender uniform of a white dress shirt and black pants. What will you be drinking this evening? I smiled to myself. A Bloody Mary. Unusual choice. Mixes good nutrition with poison. He waited for a reply that never came. Would you like to see the menu? No, just the drink. Where are the restrooms? Back there, behind that wall. The bartender gestured and smiled at me. I guess I hadn't made my disinterest clear enough. Don't worry, he said. I'll be sure to save your seat for you. I never worry, I said coldly and turned away from him. I figured that my prey had had enough time to complete most of his meal, so I stood up and looked at him again. Predictably, he was still staring at me, even as his date continued to chatter. Without uttering a word, I commanded him to follow me and walked slowly across the room. My stomach was beginning to contract, but I remained outwardly calm. He was right behind me by the time I reached the wall that separated the restrooms from the main dining area. Even before I turned around, I knew he was there. As he came closer to me, the ear changed. It became tangible and electric. When we were both out of view of his date, he said, Hey, pretty lady, did you ask me to follow you or was I imagining things? I sent the message and you received it. Get rid of your date and take me to your place. What? Right now? Are you serious? Very. Damn, he said with a combination of both shock and awe. He looked me up and down in such a lustful manner that I would have been offended if only I cared what humans thought of me. Just give me a few minutes. I'll be right with you. I returned to the bar and he went to his table. Standing over his date, he whispered in her ear. I tuned out the other sounds in the restaurant and focused on their conversation. We have to leave, he said to her in a hushed voice. Why? What happened? When I was in the bathroom, I got a call from Derek. You know he's always getting himself into something. I gotta go and bail him out of some mess. Really? What exactly is his problem? You know, something with some girl. I can tell you about it later. You must really think I'm stupid, Tony. Here we go again. What are you talking about, Lisa? He sat down on the edge of his seat, stealing himself for the argument. Do you think I didn't see you eyeballing that woman at the bar and meeting up with her in front of the bathrooms? Her voice was beginning to rise. I couldn't tell which was making you drool more, your lobster or her. Tony glanced at me. Oh, please, don't be ridiculous. I don't even know her. And that's what makes it all the more exciting. I remember how you were when we first met three whole months ago. You have the attention span of a two-year-old. Things may not be as hot as they were, but whose fault is that? Anyway, I don't have time for this argument now. I'm putting you in a cab and we can talk later. I can manage to get myself home without your assistance. This is it. Don't bother to call me again. I hope she's worth it. Lisa opened her purse, threw some cash on the table, and hurried out of the restaurant. Tony signaled to the waiter to bring the check. After he paid the bill, he came over to me at the bar. He was visibly upset, but he pulled himself together. Hunger was gnawing at my insides, but my appearance was relaxed. All right now, pretty lady. I did what you asked and got rid of her even though I think that she was really into me. I hope you're ready to make it worth my while. I will be, as soon as you pay for my drink. He frowned, but placed a $10 bill on the bar for the Bloody Mary that I had not even touched. What's your name? He asked as we walked out of the restaurant. I was tempted to say Mary, but figured that the irony would be lost on him. So I said, Vanessa, which is not my name. I'm very pleased to make your acquaintance, Vanessa. I'm Tony. I did not reply. My car is right across the street. The silver convertible Porsche there. It's a great car for driving with the top down on hot summer nights. As we crossed the street, he unlocked the doors remotely with his key fob. I walked around to the passenger side and let myself in. Once he was comfortably in the leather seat, 
He retracted the roof and turned on the sound system, loud. We drove through the streets with his obnoxious rap music blasting a monotonous beat and spewing out lurid lyrics, and I knew I would enjoy ending his life. After about 15 minutes, while we were stopped at a light, he grabbed my chin and kissed me roughly on the lips, catching me by surprise. I guess he thought he was being sexy. I was furious, but said nothing. Another 20 minutes passed, and we parked behind a tall condominium building in the Chevy Chase area. As we entered, the contrast between the warm air outdoors and the cold air inside was harsh. Soon, we were at the door of his sixth floor apartment. I paused, waiting for an invitation to enter his home. I didn't actually need one, but this was a courtesy that I liked to maintain. Along with sexually arousing prey to release endorphin, it was a part of the humane slaughter tradition. Come on in. Looking at his apartment, not to mention his car, it was clear that Tony prided himself in being a stylish lover above all else. The living room was furnished completely in black and white. Two black leather sofas flanked a white Mongolian fur rug, which lay in front of a marble fireplace. The walls were painted white and black drapes pooled on the floor in front of the windows. The tables and lamps were made of glass, chrome, and more black leather. A mammoth television set was across from the fireplace. White candles and a few small sculptures had been placed throughout the room. It was neat, clean, colorless, and deadly cold. I walked into the center of the room, took off my shoes, and stood on the rug in front of the empty fireplace. Then I turned to look at him. Still standing by the door, Tony removed his shoes, took off his socks, and put one neatly in each shoe. Then he placed the shoes side by side by the front door. Next, he turned on the television set with a remote that had been left on an end table. An adult movie began, but the sound was just barely audible. An anonymous man and two plasticine women were engaged in sexual acrobatics. Was this supposed to excite me? It seemed that Tony had a routine that he was hell-bent on following. In silence, he retrieved a box of matches from the mantel and lit a musky incense stick that was already halfway burned. I remained standing. He turned on some soft jazz. He went to another room and returned with a bottle of wine and two glasses. As he placed them on the end table, I finally sat down on one of the sofas and watched him fill each glass halfway with white wine. I'll be right back, he said. Don't go anywhere. He left the room again, and I decided to give him five more minutes at best. I was famished and lost patience long time ago. I heard a toilet flush and the sounds of him brushing his teeth. I shook my head. Unbelievable. Finally, Tony came back into the living room. Again, I stood in the middle of the rug, and he walked over to me. I began unbuttoning his shirt. The silk and mother of pearl buttons were smooth and cold against my fingers. I unbuckled his snakeskin belt. As soon as I unfastened his pants, they fell to the floor. He had on black silk boxers, of course. I placed my hands on his upper arms to keep him still and basked in the energy he radiated, moving my face slowly across and down his neck, shoulders, chest, abdomen, and groin. It almost overwhelmed my senses. This was going to be exquisite. Tony pulled me up to a standing position and unzipped my dress to reveal my red lace teddy and lace top stockings. Beautiful lady in red, he said softly. I smiled at his cliched response. Men were so predictable and easily manipulated. I always wore red when I went out hunting because I knew that the color excited and agitated them. It seemed to elicit almost a reflex reaction, like the cape waved in front of a bull by the matador, Spanish for killer. Tony tried to kiss me on the mouth again, but I pulled away. Instead of kissing him, I picked up our clothing and tossed the pile onto one of the sofas. Tony seemed to be at a loss, confused by my behavior, so he remained almost motionless until I pulled him down onto the rug. I paused to look at him for a moment. 
He was in an awkward position, not quite sitting, not quite kneeling. What are you waiting for? I'm dying to see what you have in mind. Enough with the suspense. Life flat on your back. He obeyed and I removed the decorative comb that had been holding my braided hair in a neat bun. It was sleek, simple, and made of smooth sterling silver. Two of the teeth were longer than the others, spaced about an inch apart. Very deliberately, I placed the comb on the rug next to Tony's head. As I straddled him, I grabbed both of his wrists with my left hand and forcefully pushed them to the floor above his head. I held them there. He smiled and exclaimed, you're wicked, aren't you? Very. I picked up my comb and slowly dragged it down his left cheek, stopping at the side of his neck. At this point, he was still smiling, but his expression soon changed. I pressed the comb against him and the two long teeth pierced his skin and sank into his carotid artery. What the hell are you doing? He cried out in pain. I said nothing. At first he struggled to get up, but I held him fast, using my will more than my muscles to subdue him. He was a fool to think that he was stronger than I, and my aim had been precise. Soon a pool of blood was forming on the white fur rug. Be still, I commanded. His struggling ceased, but he continued to watch me in silent terror. Careful to avoid getting blood on me, I leaned over Tony's body and covered the wounds on his neck with my mouth. Blood coursed from his artery into my throat and I could finally exploit the necromantic energy that he had accumulated during his lifetime of eating slaughtered animals. Tony's offense may have been unwitting, but nevertheless, every action has a consequence. He probably didn't know that each animal's suffering and death at the hands of humans created mystical energy that permeated the animal's body. Each time Tony had eaten meat or any other substance derived from a brutalized creature, he had defiled himself, contaminated his own blood, and made himself enticing to those of us at the top of the food chain. Now he was fully charged and I delighted in draining him. It invigorated me. As I consumed Tony's blood, I witnessed the pathetic lives of the animals he had eaten passing before me like images on a movie screen, there for my entertainment. The energy from his last meal brought me to the greatest heights of ecstasy. I relished the terror and pain of the lobster who had been taken from his home, imprisoned and boiled alive only an hour or two earlier. The creature had been stupid to let himself get caught. I reveled in his anguish and the torment of several hundred animals whose flesh Tony had eaten over his lifetime. Their suffering flooded back more quickly and in less detail, but it was just as real and amusing to me. This is what I had been waiting for, and what a feast. His tainted blood was warm and thick and a little bit bitter. It had a flavor and a power like no other substance, well worth the wait. Gulping it down, I became almost dizzy. I could feel myself getting stronger. I drank until I was cloyed, and then I drank a little more. All in all, Tony was a very satisfying meal. And now, he too was dead. Well, thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Please share your thoughts in the comments, and I'm looking forward to seeing you next time. Take care.